let me ask you a question. If you could have anything at all, what would it be? Most people would say wealth. The ability to buy all the Mountain Dew that they've ever desired. Other people would say power. To enforce their will onto others. Like a sweaty, no-life Discord moderator. Whereas some people would even say fame. To have their name echo throughout the minds of the masses, like the attention-seeking little nuisance they are. But the real question is, what then? When you have everything you've ever wanted, and the world is in your hands, what happens then? What happens then, my friends, is Saints Row the Third. Saints Row the Third? <laughs> More like Saints Row the Turd, am I right guys? What? No, this game is amazing. You just have no taste. Are you having a laugh? This game is bloody bollocks, mate. No, just don't, no, look, you just don't a have a clue what are you're you talking about. This, this is game... Oh, this is gonna be spicy. To say that Saints Row the Third is a controversial game would be an understatement. Even now, over 10 years after its release, it is still causing flaming hot debates about whether or not it was a good or bad addition to the series as a whole. Some people love it. Recommended. 10 out of 10. You can kill furries. Recommended. I have to poop really bad. Recommended. Boob. Whereas others don't like it at all. Not recommended. I'd rather buy Winra. Not recommended. My mum caught me playing this game and now I'm banned from my PC for two weeks. Not recommended. Game does not work, I want my five dollars back, I could have bought and drugs. So who's right? And who's wrong? Well, before we get into that, how about we have a quick history lesson? The Saints Row series began back in 2006, with the release of Saints Row 1, a gangster game in a similar vein to that of GTA San Andreas. Despite being an Xbox 360 exclusive and being misrepresented by critics at the time, it still sold quite well. At least, enough to warrant the development of its sequel, Saints Row 2, which came out just two years later in 2008 and improved upon its predecessor in almost every way, selling even better as a result. With two highly successful games with an upwards trajectory, a third release was highly expected by fans of the franchise. And in 2011, such expectations would come to fruition, with the subsequent announcement of Saints Row 3. I mean, uh, Saints Row the Third. Wait, what? Why is it...? Ugh. We'll get back to that later. Unlike the last two games, which were announced and marketed in a frankly comically unprofessional fashion, Saints Row the Third's announcement can only be described as an absolute spectacle of hype. A state-of-the-art CGI trailer that set the scene of the game very well. But not only that, they also showed off the real meat and potatoes of the game in the form of some actual gameplay, which proved to be equally as impressive. Rare by today's standards, I have to say. The CGI trailer, combined with the impressive gameplay demonstration, solidified the game's marketing extremely well. And upon its release, Saints Row III would actually go on to sell even more copies than both of its predecessors. Needless to say then, that it was considered to be a massive financial success. But all that glitters is not gold. For the people who had never played a Saints Row game before, Saints Row III was rated most positively. But for those who had played what came before it, Saints Row III was generally considered to be a massive disappointment. In more ways than one. But the question is then, why? I mean, what is it about this game in particular that draws so much controversy, especially from long-term fans? As alluded to earlier, Saints Row 1 and 2 both had quite a serious plot, and how they both began showcased such severity instantaneously. Saints Row 1 starts off with you almost getting shot in an alleyway, and Saints Row 2 starts off with you in a prison. So then, you may expect the third game in the series to begin in similar dire circumstances. Well... The game starts off with this weird Star Wars-style text introduction, which, considering this is supposed to be a game about gangsters, is quite a strange choice, to say the least. 
but that's nothing compared to what comes next. Saints Row 1 was all about a guy who managed to escape death and ended up joining a gang to attempt to help clean up the streets, only to end up being betrayed by those closest to him. And Saints Row 2 was all about revenge, regaining your now lost status and rebuilding the Saints from scratch. Both of these games have a similar theme. You started off with nothing and built yourself up until you had everything. It's a classic rags to riches story each time. But there's only so many times you can tell that story with the same cast of characters, as inevitably there's only so long you can stay in the gutter before you ascend upwards. And that, ultimately, is the biggest difference between Saints Row the Third and those that came before it. Here, the Saints are no longer grimy gangsters, but national celebrities, having their own movie deals, energy drink, and even custom clothes stores. And, in a way, I get it. Now, I don't know who you are, but statistically speaking, you're probably not a millionaire, are you? Well, me neither. But if we both got up tomorrow morning and found out we won the lottery, are we really gonna stay the same? Hell no! We'd buy a huge mansion, get a sweet car, spoil ourselves a bit, and, you know, over time, we'd change. Whether we like it or not. And that's the entire undertone of Saints Row the Third. Selling out and going corporate. The Saints, due to their newfound success, have changed, and in the process, forgot who they are. Which is pretty ironic if you think about it, considering that back in Saints Row 1, Julius created the Third Street Saints for this exact same reason. He believed that his previous gang, the Vice Kings, was becoming too corporatized and was forgetting their roots. Yet here in Saints Row the Third, the Saints have officially become what it was they were created to fight in the first place. And it's the natural cycle of life. The rise, the peak, and the fall. And, I don't know about you, but I think that's quite poetic. And make no mistake, the game is more than self-aware of this hypocrisy, and even actively tries to capitalise on it. As alluded to earlier, there's a reason why this game isn't called Saints Row 3, but instead Saints Row the Third. And that's because it isn't Saints Row 3. Saints Row is a series about gangs, desperation, and survival. But those times are over. Saints Row the Third, then, is indeed a much more accurate title. A technical continuation of the series, but not really. It is, instead, an overly pompous mockery, an abomination of sorts. The same, in a way, but clearly not. And I don't think there's perhaps a greater example of this disparity than the game's new logo. As you can see, Saints Row 1 and 2 shared relatively the same logo, which comprised of this cool gangster font in shiny silver. However, Saints Row the Third completely ditched this style in favour of this much more elegant logo instead. Now you're probably thinking, so what? It's just a logo. But actually, it's a lot more important than you might think. From a branding perspective, I can't express to you enough just how rare a logo change of this calibre actually is. This here is a box of Pokemon Red from all the way back in the 1990s. And this here is the box of the Pokemon Diamond remake that came out just now in 2021. Notice how the core logo has remained completely unchanged throughout all these decades. You'll find this to be the case with almost every game series imaginable, as a logo is more than just a bunch of words, but a symbol that can often represent nostalgia, quality, or a mix of the two that can heavily influence purchasing power. If you know anything about branding, then you'll know that logos are serious business, and you don't just change them without good reason. Which is why it's even weirder this logo change actually occurred, because the Saints Row series wasn't exactly in need of reinventing. It was doing better than ever, and that is exactly the point. The logo change, much like the odd title, is a subtle yet huge declaration that this is not the Saints Row that you know and love. It's different. 
completely different. And I'm explaining this in such depth because I want to make it absolutely clear that yes, I am more than aware that this is the theme that they were going for. The game is a fundamental critique of what happens when you become too successful for your own good. Cold, corporate, soulless, just as intended. However, that doesn't change the fact that it's crap. Now don't get me wrong, I think the idea of a third game whereby the saints forget who it is they are and become soft, soulless corporates sounds like a great idea. However, that is assuming that the story is told well, makes sense, and of course ends with either the saints seeing the error of their ways, or getting replaced entirely by those who do. But that's the fundamental problem. It doesn't. The entire game is written in such a terribly unrealistic, over-the-top fashion that it's hard to take it seriously at all. And that's all fine and dandy when you're dealing with a completely fresh intellectual property, as then you can kind of do as you please. But when you go from a serious setting like what came before it in Saints Row 1 and 2 to whatever the hell this is, it feels like a slap in the face. As if all the events that occurred in the previous games were ultimately for naught. For example, the very first thing you do in the game is rob a bank. Alright, sounds quite Saints Row to me. But hang on a minute. Why? I mean, if the Saints are now multi-million dollar celebrities, what on earth would they be robbing a bank for? What are they, stupid? I mean, I get that old habits die hard, but Christ, you're the top dogs of a world-famous gang turned corporation. There are easier ways to make money. The Saints used to do crime because they needed to. Now they do crime because they feel like it. But it's not just the story that's absurd. Oh, no, no, no. That's just the half of it. The gameplay is just... Unbelievable. Just like Saints Row 2, right at the start of the game, you get to select your difficulty. And as ever, I of course played on Hardcore. Not that I would have noticed if I hadn't, however, as one of the biggest problems this game has is that it feels less like you're playing a game and more like an interactive movie at times. It's far, far too scripted, and on many occasions, especially early on in the game, it just flat out refuses to let you actually fail. For example, during the initial bank robbery, it all goes tits up, and you end up dangling off the top of this vault, getting shot at by a bunch of armoured guards and helicopters. Now, naturally, the game just expects you to blast on through them. But, I had a bit of an idea. What would happen if I just didn't do anything? And well, as it turns out, nothing. Hey everyone, I just started up Saints Row 3, and uh... Yeah, I'm playing on hardcore difficulty, and uh, yeah, this is really, this is really hardcore. I've got to say, literally, like, look, look, I'm not pressing anything, and I'll still somehow stay alive. I mean, how is this hardcore? Look, look they're blowing themselves up. They're blowing themselves up. I'm not even doing anything. <laughs> This is a laughing stock. Whereas past games weren't scared to let you fail, and in many ways actually embraced it, such as the first ever mission of Saints Row 1 whereby failure would reward you with an alternative cutscene, in this game, the developers instead opted to have some stupid silly scenarios like this, probably because they crossed their fingers and just hoped nobody would notice. But I noticed. Always watching, Wazowski. Always watching. And this type of scripting doesn't just happen here, but a ton of places. Just after the bank heist, there's a part of the game whereby you have to save Shaundy from falling off a plane. And just to see if it was possible, I purposely tried not to save her. However, the game just forces you to, no matter what. You literally can't fail, even if you try. Same thing with this plane. The game asks you to shoot the windows, but it makes no difference whether you do it or not. And oh no, look, a quick time punch event. That also makes no difference if you respond to it or not either. It's very difficult to enjoy a game that plays itself. But again, most of this nonsense really only occurs in the intro. The real pain here is the story. So, you rob the bank, get caught, and end up tied up on a plane. Turns out the bank was owned by a criminal organization known as the Syndicate. They then attempt to extract wealth from the Saints, which goes about as well as you'd expect. But what happens next, truly, is mind-blowing. 
Let me ask you a question. Excluding the boss, who is by far the most iconic and influential character in the Saints Row series? I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? It's obviously Johnny Gett. All right, so Volition has a universally adored badass character. So what did they decide to do? Give him a starring role and carry on his story? No, they kill him off right at the start of the game. I mean, what? Why? I mean, at first I thought, oh, I know, it's some sort of metaphor, right? Like, Gat is the last surviving character that still remains from Saints Row 1, and so him dying on a plane, no less, oh yeah, that's, that's kind of like symbolic, right? Like, the last connection the series had to its original roots has been cut when they were at their highest point. Oh yeah, that's good, that's good. But then I realised that, nah, Volition's not that smart. They cheaply kill off one of their most beloved characters, off-screen no less, in a vain attempt to build some sort of desire for vengeance from the player. It's just <laughs> terrible writing. I will never understand what they were thinking with this. I mean, Saints Row without Johnny Gat is like San Andreas without Big Smoke. It just wouldn't feel right. I can't stand it when shows, movies, and especially games just kill off a beloved character out of the blue uh, just to advance the plot and shock the audience. It's like, I'm sorry, but that's just bad writing. But anyway, then the Saints, and by the Saints I mean the boss Pierce and Jaundy, end up landing in this city called Steelport, whereby they now have a target on their head from the Syndicate, and are pretty much screwed. Yeah, what a plotline. Ugh. Well, but with that said, it's not all doom and gloom. The character creator has been much improved. Well, actually, it depends on how you look at it, I guess. If you want, you can now play as Thanos. Or maybe the Incredible Hulk, if that's more you think. On the one hand, I can't really complain about such absurdities as the Saints Row series has always allowed you to create some proper gnarly characters. But this takes it to the next level. Which is either a good or bad thing, depending on your perspective. As ever, of course, I first tried to create myself. Let me just get my muscle right. Yeah, there we go. And... Ta-da! Looks just like me. But fellas. Fellas. You didn't think I forgot about Blobby now, did you? Oh no, sir. Blobby is looking better and fatter than ever. Oh yeah. So then, we're in Steelport, we're screwed. Now what? Now we have to take down the Syndicate who's after our heads, and slowly take over the city. And this is usually the part where I'd go through each one of the three gangs and explain to you who they are. But with this game, I'm really going to struggle to do that, as unlike in past games, the three gangs here aren't totally separate from one another, but as stated earlier, united under one banner. Regardless, I'll give it my best shot. First, represented by the colour of red, we have the Morning Star. These fellas are mostly from Europe and tend to operate a bunch of brothels. The men in this gang tend to dress like they're James Bond, whereas the ladies are dressed like... well... The Morning Star are considered to be the business side of the Syndicate, handling most monetary affairs. They're led by a guy called Philip Laron, who is introduced at the start of the game as if he's going to be the main villain. But you have to remember that this game makes no sense whatsoever, so don't be surprised when that doesn't last very long. Apart from that, however, I have bugger all else to say about them. They are, to put it bluntly, probably the plainest gang ever introduced to the franchise. Next, represented by the colour of green, we have the Luchadors. These guys are really just a bunch of big, muscly dudes who like to wrestle each other wearing masks. They are considered to be the brawn of the Syndicate, handling any physical affairs. Led by the so-called Walking Apocalypse Killbane, the Luchadors are certainly not ones to be messed with. Well, actually, they kind of are because they're complete dumbasses, but anyway, besides the point. Lastly, represented by the colour of blue, we have the Deckers. Dressing up like some sort of bad cyberpunk cosplay from 2005, the Deckers are considered to be the brains of the Syndicate, handling any technological affairs. Led by an annoying bastard called Matt Miller, the Deckers are perhaps the least saint Rowy of gangs imaginable, with most of their members being closer to representing Redditors rather than gangsters. I mean, be real with me now, does this guy look a gangster to you? No, I don't think so. And as mentioned earlier, due to all of them being a part of the Syndicate, the individual gangs themselves barely get any time in the spotlight, and certainly never get enough time to actually differentiate themselves from each other. Whereas in the previous games each gang was very distinct, here the lines are completely blurred. 
The individual gang storylines from past games which provided a non-linear route to progress have been completely eliminated here, with the game now having one set storyline, with each gang just being blended into it. I mean Christ, even when you get gang notoriety, it all appears as the exact same syndicate icon, regardless of who it is you're actually fighting. Which, really, should say it all about just how little effort was put in actually making these gangs feel distinct from one another. Such a pity. However, we're not done yet, as there's also Stag. Much like Ultor from Saints Row 2, Stag serves as a sort of fourth enemy. They're essentially an arm of the US military that was specifically created to end domestic gang violence once and for all. Now on paper, Stag sounds like a really cool concept, but in practice, it's just absolutely ridiculous. These guys have body armor, vehicles and weapons that makes them look like they're from the year 3000 or something like that. I mean, for Christ's sake, look at this scene here and tell me that it isn't absolutely absurd. Laser rifles in a gangster video game. I mean, this scene here looks like it was ripped straight out of Star Wars. The game doesn't even try to be realistic or serious in pretty much any way whatsoever anymore. Case in point, right, imagine this. You're in a city where you don't know anyone, and you have a target on your head by the most powerful group in that city. And so, what do you do? Do you keep your head down and try to play it cool? Nah, how about robbing a military base for weapons instead? Yeah, really. And this, by the way, is the second mission in the game. The second mission in the game, and I'm using weapons of mass destruction against the US military for no reason whatsoever, as if I'm playing Call of Duty or something like that. I mean, this game just can't decide what it wants to be. Is it a gangster game? Is it a military game? Is it a Star Wars game? I mean, Christ, there's even a part where they have you fighting zombies. I mean, just what is going on here? What is this game? It's like it has some sort of multiple personality disorder whereby the game can't make its mind up about what it wants to be. One minute I'm fighting people in virtual reality, and the next I'm pretending to be on Mars. What? Who? When? Why? How? Oh. I can't help but strongly get the impression that after making Saints Row 1 and 2 back to back, that Volition desperately wanted to make something else. But due to the success of the Saints Row franchise, they just had to keep rolling with it, and they just ended up bunging it up with such numerous abstract ideas like the ones presented here. Well, either that or having got tired of constantly having their hard work being unjustly referred to as a GTA clone, just decided to completely transform the franchise into going off the rails and being ultra wacky as to clearly set it apart, which, if true by the way, was a really stupid idea. I mean, a third of the missions are just you shooting stuff out of a helicopter, another third is you doing some stupid silly things that make no narrative sense, and the other third is just you doing activities. Oh, and speaking of activities, what the hell did you do to them? Activities used to be a staple of the Saints Row series. You used to have to go out of your way to do them in order to gain respect, which only then would allow you to do missions. Well now, that entire system has completely gone out the window. Now, you no longer need respect to do missions. Oh no. Respect is now just an arbitrary level that, depending on how high it is, allows you to buy some exciting unlocks. Exciting unlocks, such as taking 10% less damage from fire. How exciting. But hang on a minute, if you no longer need respect to do missions, then what's the point of activities? Exactly, there is no point. To say that activities have been gutted would be an understatement. For starters, there are no more levels like there were in the past, so you're just going to be doing borderline the exact same activities over and over again. And secondly, the only reward you actually get from doing them is money and a bunch of other useless miscellaneous crap. And lastly, there aren't even any activity cutscenes anymore. You're just expected to do them with no narrative reasoning whatsoever. I mean, this is just pathetic. I mean, what a downgrade. I managed to complete Saints Row the Third in only around 8 hours or so, which is under half of how long it took me to complete 1 and 2. But is it any wonder why? Activities that used to make up half the game are now borderline irrelevant. No wonder the game feels so short. There are only two real new ones regardless. Guardian Angel, which is basically just sniping a bunch of dudes out of a helicopter. Yawn. 
and Professor Genki's Super Ethical Reality Climax, which, yes, is its real name, whereby you just go around gunning down furries before time runs out. Actually, I don't mind that one. The rest of the activities, however, were just ripped straight from Saints Row 2, with pretty much no noticeable changes whatsoever. Well, unless you consider being in a tank doing mayhem or driving around on a VR bike during trailblazing to be significant changes, but spoiler alert, I don't. The only difference between these activities and Saints Row 2 is that now, as stated earlier, there's no point actually doing them anymore. I mean, look, if you wanted to get rid of activities, then sure, whatever. But why bother putting the work adding them in, only to neuter them to the point of irrelevancy? It's like, you already did the hard part, they're already in the game. So why did you butcher the rewards? I just... I just don't get it. But hey, at least they removed Hitman and Shop Shop, so... You know... It's good, I guess. But it's not just the activities that have been butchered. There's a ton of things that this game added to the chopping block. Are you low on health and want to get it back? That's fine, just eat some food. Oh wait, you can't anymore, because they removed it. Why, I hear you ask? Because screw you, that's why. In Saints Row 1, we had cinemas, whereby you could use them to go back and replay missions. Saints Row 2 ended up removing these, and instead made it so you can now replay missions at your crib instead, which I said was a sad loss of character. But in Saints Row the Third, you can't even do that anymore. Want to replay a mission? Tough. Start up a new game instead, or get stuffed. Baffles me that games that came out years before this one had more features. I mean, isn't it meant to be the other way around? Saints Row the Third also continues the trend that Saints Row 2 started, whereby the game has been simplified for the sake of convenience over character. Cribs have essentially been made irrelevant, serving borderline no purpose whatsoever except losing your notoriety, rest in peace forgive and forget, and all record stores have now been removed. Now, the game just gives you every track automatically on your phone without doing anything at all to earn them. I really can't stand convenience over character. I never have, and I never will. Speaking of tracks, I think it's time I give my radio station tier list. But unlike the past tier lists, this one is going to be quite a bit different. From best to worst. S tier, classic and the mix. Both of these stations feature some absolutely classic bangers that are most pleasurable to the ears. Brace yourself. F tier, everything else. Now, I know you guys are going to think that I've gone off my rocker, but I'm serious. I'm 100% serious. This is actually my tier list. K-Rhyme, which had always been my favourite station featuring some glorious gangster rap, has since been polluted with what can only be described as absolute <laughs> sh**. Serious question, what happened to rap music in the 2010s? It's like, I remember 1990s rap, amazing, 2000s rap, oh amazing, but then as soon as the world hit 2010, it's like rap just took a nosedive, it, you know, it went from being lyrical and, and actually rhyming to just being a bunch of mumbling bollocks. Is it just me who's noticed this? What the hell happened to rap? Just sad. The other returning stations aren't much better either. Gen X, a station which a lot of you for some reason swear by, still sounds like a midlife crisis. And K-12 still sounds like a bunch of robots having intercourse aboard the International Space Station. So needless to say, still not impressed with that either. And don't even get me started on these new stations, I mean honestly, Cabron sounds like how K-Rhyme used to, except this time through Google Translate. Uh, Blood, I am convinced, is an April Fool's joke created just to see if anyone would take it seriously. And I don't even know what this is, but it scares the hell out of me. Look, I have no idea what's happened to tunes in this game, but they are just absolutely horrendous. It's like they fired the last guy who was in charge of the tracks and replaced him with an absolute knucklehead. In my playlist, I only ended up with Power by Kanye West and a bunch of Mozart. <laughs> That's how bad it is. But of course, as ever, music taste is subjective, so whereas I may consider this to be a complete downgrade, some of you might actually consider it to be an upgrade. You people also need to get your ears checked if you think that, but hey. Speaking of downgrades, we just have to talk about Steelport. I don't think I have ever seen a more dull, boring, repetitive, and frankly, soulless city than this one. 
I can't comprehend for the life of me how the same guys who created Stillwater, which is one of the best virtual cities ever made, could completely 180 and come out with this. Whereas Stillwater was incredibly defined and unique, absolutely everywhere in Steelport just feels exactly the same. This sort of grey, industrial, smog-like setting, I mean, oh, it's just awful. There's not a single place I can point to on this map and go, oh yeah, there's something really cool there. Absolutely nothing at all. In fact, I can't memorise a single place on this map. And I just bloody played it! It's as if the game gives you a sort of dementia, whereby you can't remember anything about the city after playing it. That's how forgettable it is. I imagine the reason why Steelport comes across as so forgettable is because upon completing a mission, you no longer take over territory like you used to. Whereas after completing Saints Row 1 and 2, your map would be a sea of purple. Here, the game expects you to do stupid silly things like buying buildings, as if you're playing Monopoly or something like that. Why on earth the developers didn't have the intelligence to understand that they had a winning formula already and didn't need to change it, I don't know. And speaking of intelligence, we need to talk about the AI. Artificial intelligence. <laughs> you must be having a laugh. I mean, look, I know Saints Row has always had issues with follower pathfinding and the like, and has never exactly been a pinnacle of impressive AI. But my word, these guys are some major league morons. I came across this surgery, whereby I was told that if I held off enemies for long enough, I could take it over. But I noticed that all the enemies would just spawn outside the surgery. So, I had an idea. What if I just hid inside the surgery and waited until time ran out? Would the AI be smart enough to find me, or would they completely fail? Well, let's find out. <laughs> The answer, of course, was no. I could stand still and not press a single button and still somehow manage to win. Christ. And even after doing so, some saints just turned up and wiped out the enemies for me, so I didn't even have to deal with them either. I mean, honestly, it's just hard to believe just how much is wrong with this game. Admittedly, however, if I may play devil's advocate for a moment, there are some things that are actually an improvement. The game does give you the ability to actually make some meaningful choices throughout the story, which is a first and is certainly a welcome addition. Also, being able to upgrade your weapons and make them better is a great change. And driving too, overall, feels much more sharp. But ultimately, none of these improvements can possibly counterbalance the depth, maturity, and frankly, quality that the game lacks. Now at this point, some of you may be going, damn, this looks good for a game that came out over 10 years ago. But actually, I've been pulling a bit of a sneaky on you this whole time. You see, there are actually two versions of Saints Row the Third. The original that came out back in 2011, and a remastered version that came out in 2020. The gameplay you've seen today is pretty much all from that remastered version. Now if you know me, you'll know that I'm not one to buy remakes, and especially not remasters. But I knew I'd be going back to review this game for you all, and I saw the remaster was on sale for 75% off, and I thought, hey, why not? I'll spoil myself a bit. Mistakes were made. I had heard some fantastic things about this remaster. People told me that it had a great resolution bump, higher frame rates, improved textures, great lighting, etc, etc. And yes, all of those things are absolutely true. There's no doubt about it. From a cosmetic standpoint, it is absolutely an upgrade over the original. But what people didn't tell me, however, was the unbelievable amount of crashes that I would face. The first time the game crashed was seconds into the first cutscene. That's right, before I'd even played the game, it had already crashed. It would just close the game and return me straight back to the dashboard, with no error message or warning. This would happen roughly every hour, for seemingly no reason. 
I tried to pinpoint if there was anything that was specifically causing it to crash, uh, maybe too many NPCs or explosions on screen, but it just seemed completely and utterly random. And let me tell you, there is absolutely no more frustrating than going through a mission, being 90% done with said mission, only for the game to crash, forcing me to do it all over again, time after time after time. So after getting sick of the crashes, I looked up if anyone else was also having the same issues. And it turns out, it wasn't just a problem on my end. I came across forum post after forum post of people reporting the exact same problem on both Xbox, PlayStation and PC. I got so frustrated with the game's constant crashing that I ended up only playing it for around 1-2 to two hours at a time before I just had to put it down to prevent me from having a stroke. However, eventually I came across a forum post that said apparently the crashes only happen if you play the game with an internet connection. And when I first saw that, I was like, what? It's a single player game. <laughs> no, it's not going to be that. But lo and behold, after crash after crash, I got so desperate that I ended up playing offline just to see if it would actually work. And unbelievably, it did. I got not a single crash at all as soon as I went offline. But why? Well, your guess is as good as mine. I can only assume that for some reason, when you have an internet connection, the game has a sort of invisible background process that attempts to connect to some sort of server at random times, and for some reason, it always seems to fail, which results in a crash. What and why it's doing such, I have no idea. Perhaps some sort of DRM bollocks? No clue. But what's so absurd about this entire situation is that crashes of this magnitude are unacceptable at launch. But it's not launch. This game's been out for over a year at the time of recording. And it's still crashing now! The fact that Deep Silver is willing to continue to sell a game with such a glaring issue should only be testament to what a shameless label they truly are. You know, come to think of it, this remaster is kind of like the exact opposite of the GTA Definitive Edition. Whereas the GTA Definitive Edition looked ugly, it never crashed, well, at least for me. Whereas this looks beautiful, but it's about as stable as the average Redditor. As I said, I bought this for 75% off, and I still feel ripped off. Buy beware on this, folks, as it seems like they have zero intention to fix this at all. As strange as this may sound, one of the worst parts about this remaster was the DLCs. Yeah, something not a lot of people may remember about the original Saints Row III is the sheer amount of absolute garbage DLC that it had. Now, of course, I adore DLC when it's, you know, actually good, such as missions and the like. But a lot of this was just nonsense like vehicles, uh, clothing items, you know, cheap silly tact. Because a lot of this DLC was just flat out pay to win, meaning you just paid money and got it with no effort, in the remaster you start the game with an absolute metric ton of unearned clothes, uh, vehicles, I mean you name it. The VTOL for example, which is an aircraft that is only meant to be obtained halfway throughout the game when Stag turns up, can now be used way earlier on. Having a game with all this DLC that you don't have to earn makes the game feel weird, as if you're being rewarded for doing nothing. There's no sense of reward or progression in this game, and it's just strange. Weirdly enough, the most fun I had in this game was the weird little bonus mode that it had. Yeah, so if you go on the main menu, you'll find this option called Horde Mode, and yes, that really is its name, which is basically like um, the Zombies Mode from Call of Duty, except with perverts. You get given a certain weapon and have to clear out waves of them and survive, and it sounds boring, but as I said, it genuinely was a lot of fun. Way more so than the main game, actually, which I can't believe that I'm actually saying. Granted, probably the reason why I enjoyed this mode so much is because you get to destroy a bunch of lustful demons. And, after all, lust is a sin. No, but on a serious note, I don't know what the hell it is about Saints Row the Third, but it feels a lot more lusty than the previous games. Like, Saints Row has always been a bit lusty, right? Like, there's always been strip clubs and things like that, but Christ, Saints Row the Third just <laughs> takes it to a whole new level. 
If you play through this game, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's weird. Really weird. Actually, after thinking about it a bit more, the reason why this game is probably so lustful is because it's trying to attract a mass market audience, and, as we all know, lust is a big seller. Oh, Sean dear, you're such a beautiful lady. <laughs> Dude, I'm not even real. Get a life. <laughs> oh, Sean dear, you're real to me. <laughs> Jesus Christ, find a real woman. A real lady? <laughs> what is this, 1960? <laughs> Sean dear, you're my waifu. Never forget it. <sighs> I'm gonna be honest, going into this, I fully expected to hate the story, but like the gameplay, and was prepared to tell everyone that actually, Saints Row the Third wasn't that bad, and that everyone just judges it too harshly. But my god, was this game way worse than I remember it. Not just narratively, but the gameplay too. To transform a beloved and established series for no reason into something completely different is just mind-blowing. Saints Row 1 and 2 were art. You can tell that they were games that were made passionately and from the heart. But I don't get that same warm, fuzzy feeling from this game. Not at all. This game feels like a forced, bizarre, pop culture, artificially manufactured product designed to cater to the lowest common denominator of the mindless masses. And as stated earlier, that was indeed the originally intended underlying tone of the game, but it was never actually capitalised on the game became a parody of the very thing that it was trying to critique. For some reason, it seems like the Saints Row franchise is cursed with radically transforming itself every two games, due to foolish developer decisions. But the fundamental heart and soul of Saints Row will always be the first two games, and this game's mere existence only proves such a fact very well. A friend of mine once said to me, Alex, if you've ever wondered why the Saints Row community is 50% badass and 50% dumbass, Saints Row the Third is the reason why. And I understand where he was coming from, but in a way I disagree. I think that if this was your first Saints Row game, I don't blame you for liking it. I don't blame you for thinking that it's good. Because if you looked at this game in a vacuum and judged it purely on what it is, it's not a bad game per se. But when you have the knowledge and experience and understand what came before it, in comparison to that, the game is absolutely abysmal. Let's just be honest for a moment about what Saints Row the Third is. Saints Row the Third was a backstab. It was a betrayal. Volition created a beloved intellectual property, a fantastic series that had a loyal and dedicated fan base behind it. And they gave that fan base the middle finger. Because instead, they decided to completely transmogrify the series into becoming a mindless, soulless, corporate joke in order to appeal to a mass market audience. 